My name is John Carvelli. I'd like to call the meeting to order today, the California State Athletic Commission, Tuesday, February 19, 2019, here in Anaheim, California. Welcome. Uh, our first order of business will be to uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Dr. Williams, will you lead us in the pledge of sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, before you sit down, sir, we have some great news, some exciting news. Uh, we have a new commissioner who's on our ranks here. If anyone hasn't met Mr. James Araby, Jim Araby, here he is. You can welcome him. Thank you. We're just getting to know him. We're looking forward to, to working with him. But before we establish our core, I am going to swear you in, sir. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. I think you have to hold your hand up. All right. Uh, James Araby, do you solemnly swear and affirm that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and to the Constitution of the State of California, and that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which you are about to enter? Yes, I do. Congratulations, Wells. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Great to have you. I think you have to get that. All right. We'll help you figure that out. <laughs> Mr. Foster, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Chairman Carvelli. Here. Vice Chair Lehman. Here. Commissioner Senior Kedaz. Here. Commissioner Souter. Here. Commissioner and Dr. Williams. Here. Commissioner Ayella. Here. Commissioner Araby. Here. So we have a quorum, seven. Thank you. I've already made my welcome. Um, I have a few uh, announcements to make in addition to our new commissioner. Jim, we have uh, a couple of housekeeping items. We welcome Tricia Blackstock. You're going to be working with us now, Tricia, for a while. Whatever it means. Well, welcome. Good to see you. I know you're experienced in this stuff. Say hello to Tricia if you haven't met her, everyone. And uh, Mr. Walker, counselor, this is your last meeting with us. You've been appointed to the Department of Treasury. Yes. Here in the state of California, congratulations to, you. for you, and we thank you for your service. <laughs> and we'll have somebody else with us at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Very good. Would you make sure he wears a bow tie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're the I've bow tie guys. We had a chance to attend an event on uh, Saturday evening at, at the, uh, what is the where they do the Emmys, Microsoft Theater, at LA Live. And it was, uh, Commissioner Martha was there. It was an interesting event because in this you know, forum they had the, the, the audience there. So the, 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 uh, the ring was up on stage. And it was really interesting to kind of sit there as we sit and watch the fight to see the whole audience out there. It was a different perspective, right? Very kind of, very different, we'll call it. Martha says odd, but <laughs> I thought it was different. But, yeah, it was great for TV. It was packed. It was a great location because people could come and go. And uh, we had two great fights. The undercard, John Molina, he lost it, but uh, it was a great event. Uh, and of course, Leo Santa Cruz. So great fights, great warriors. Uh, I don't know how many bouts that on Saturday night, Andy. Had Thirteen, sir. Thirteen bouts, yes, sir. seventy plus rounds of, or more. Of Over boxing. hundred, sir. Hundred rounds of boxing. Way which is the segue into the article that I think you all have seen that Andy sent to us about the number of events that were breaking records here in California. How many? So 300? 100, 118 professional boxing events. Professional. And those are how many televised? 59, sir. It'll be well over 60. Mm -hmm. We're not through our fiscal year yet. This, uh, we're doing more events as a commission, the state of California than other, the other states combined. So that's pretty exciting. And not including our amateurs, and there they are, the gentlemen there. And, but, all, but yes, including Roy Ungebrecht, who keeps doing more and more events, which is great. Mm -hmm. Of course, Golden Boy and UFC, T and Bellator, and on and on and on. So it's, it's very exciting. There's a lot of activity, a lot of respect here in California. I hear it all the time, and again on Saturday night. So again, congratulations and well done to our, all of our staff and associates at the commission. With that, uh, agenda item number three, 
is election of officers for 2018 pursuant or 19, right? Is this 19? Yes, yeah, we need to fix that. Yes, Just saw it as I said it. Pursuant to the requirements of business and professions code section 18606, we have a nomination for a chair and vice chair. Commissioners. Somebody's got uh, Yeah, I move that uh, we continue with our current uh, slate of officers with uh, Mr. Carvelli as chair and Ms. Lehman as vice chair. We have a second. Second that. Do we have any other nominations? Commissioner comments. Do you accept your nomination? Yes, I do. And so do I, with sincere gratitude and thanks. Mr. Foster, please call the roll for the vote. Chairman Carvelli. Aye. Vice Chair Lehman. Aye. Commissioner Senior Quitez. Aye. Commissioner Souter. Aye. Commissioner Dr. Williams. Aye. Commissioner Ayella. Aye. Commissioner Araby. Aye. Seven zero, sir. Thank you. Agenda item number four, approval of December 11, 2018, commission meeting minutes. Mr. Foster, do you have any changes for us to review? Not to, not to my knowledge, sir. I think this was all taken, uh, uh, all of the changes got done uh, earlier on as we as we have been practicing with the uh, getting the minutes out uh, well in advance. Commissioners, any comments, corrections, additions, deletions? Yes, thank you for the detailed minutes, and it really helps to uh, have a, a more precise record of what we've done, and especially going into the, the next meeting. And I encourage everyone to review them. Thank you, Commissioner Lehman. And this one's a great one because it's the John Jones story, which could be published as a pamphlet, maybe. <laughs> you should think about that. I need a motion to approve the minutes, please. So moved. Commissioner Shinner Key, does we have a second? I second. Vice Chair. Any other comments? Chance for the public to comment on our meeting minutes. You are welcome to stand up and be heard. Seeing none, please call the roll. Chairman Corvelli? Aye. Vice Chair Lehman? Aye. Commissioner Senior Quitez? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner Dr. Williams? Aye. Commissioner Ayella? Aye. Commissioner Araby? Aye. Seven zero, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Agenda item number five. Update from Director Grafilo. It's it's a pleasure to introduce former commissioner, <laughs> former CSAC commissioner and director of the Department of Consumer Affairs of the State of California, Dean Grafilo. All right. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Super Valley, Vice Chair Lehman. Commissioner, it's always a pleasure to address this August body. <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, um, given the fact that I used to serve as a commissioner, I've said it publicly and I'll say it. Many times over, this will always be my favorite program under the DCA umbrella. <laughs> <Yay. clears throat> um, thanks for the opportunity for allowing me to give an update uh, specific to the department. So first, I'll start with highlights from 2018. The past year, we convened nine licensing and enforcement workgroup meetings, three substance abuse coordination committee meetings, four directors quarterly meetings, pro rata workgroup meetings, and two directors board member and advisory committee tele to advisory committee leadership teleconferences by design. The goal is there is, as you may very well know, unfortunately with um, you know the many programs under DCA, there um, inherently is a tendency to get too siloed. Um, with these, uh, the goal is to obviously break those silos. Uh, it's important that we're intentional towards that goal. Um, it is an ongoing project. Uh, sometimes uh, we, need, we inevitably need to do better about that, but uh, the goal, again, is to make sure that there is a cross-pollination um, from our different programs, obviously in conjunction with the department. Um, and again, um, I've always hoped to, when I came on board nearly two years ago, and now this coming March, uh, from day one, I wanted to try to make sure that we created a, an organization in which um, those unfortunate and notable silos are less of a factor um, CSAC has been very, very good about reaching out to the department. I hope uh, the department has been uh, good in terms of being active towards advancing our shared missions and ultimately, um, hopefully the other programs, um, whether via uh, commission staff, have been able to interact with, uh, you know, with cohorts uh, in the other programs as well. 
Um, I joked with my family, now being on board uh, two years, uh, uh, my kids probably at the, at the six month mark, they would ask, uh, so dad, I uh, had some meetings today. Um, uh, nonetheless, the meetings again, um, by design are intentional to again, hopefully make sure that uh, there is, uh, you know, that cross pollination of hopefully uh, uh, best practices. Uh, you can anticipate uh, more meetings come 2019. Specific to the annual report, I invite you to review DCA's 18 annual report for a much more comprehensive view of the department's achievements. The report contains statistical and financial record of the work that the department and its board and bureaus have achieved over this past year. When you have a moment, I encourage you to visit the DCA website and review the document. Specific to trans the administration's transition and the most recent announcement of the governor's budget. As you all know, Monday, January 7th, marked a new era for our state. As, the governor, as governor Newsom was sworn in as the 40th governor of California. We at DCA are honored and excited to be part of his new team. Our department is looking forward to doing all that we can to further the governor's vision. The department has met with the transition team and many new and some familiar faces that have been appointed to new positions within the governor's office. As for, as for current appointees, there's nothing you need to do other than continuing the service and great work you have all been doing on this commission. We are currently working with the governor's appointments team regarding appointment and vacancies and pending reappointments, specific to the budget that I just mentioned. On January 10, the governor released his budget outlining the fiscal priorities for the state. Based on, all, based on the driving idea of California for All, the governor's budget proposes to pay down debts and pension obligations, continues to build a robust budget reserves, while making significant investments in housing, childcare, healthcare, prescription drugs, pre preschool, and higher education. Immediately following the budget release, the department hosted a teleconference with board leadership, executive officers, and bureau chiefs to discuss the governor's 1920 proposed budget and to review proposals within the budget specific to the department. I know understanding how the governor's budget translates to your individual, bu individual budget is a top priority, so, so I want to reiterate, as mentioned on the call, that the fiscal operations will schedule individual program meetings to discuss individual budgets in greater detail. It's my understanding that the commission had their meeting this past January 7 with our budget units. Related to the director's quarterly meetings, this coming February 25th, I will, first, I will host the first director's quarterly meeting for this year. DCA will provide an update on DCA's regulations unit, the executive officer salary study, and several division updates. As you may recall, these quarterly meetings are an opportunity to ensure that I'm, avail that I'm available to hear important, face important issues facing our programs, specific to required board member training. Con regarding board member training, Commissioner Williams, congratulations on your reappointment. Same with you, Mr. Airby. Again, on uh, this update is probably more specific to the both of you. As a reminder, members are required to complete this training within one year of appointment and reappointment to a board or commission. This is a one-day training which details the important functions and responsibilities of members. Board member orientation dates are as follows, March 27, June 19, and October 23. This year, based on feedback received from our programs, we are offering a Southern California training. The June 19th training will be in Riverside, California. Please contact Board and Bureau Services or Solid Team if you're interested in attending. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention your direct contact with Board and Bureau Services, in addition to Chris Castrillo who's here today, is also Karen DeHorace Nelson, who you uh, all know as well. Mandatory sexual harassment, harassment prevention training. 2019 is a mandatory sexual harass, harassment prevention training year for the, department of, for, for the department. This means all employees, board members, and commissioners are required to complete this training this year even if it was completed last year. This training is online, interactive, and can be completed at your convenience. If you have questions about this or any, uh, any, other, any other required trainings, please contact, again, Office of Board and Bureau Services. Related to Sunset Review. As one of our 10 programs undergoing Sunset Review this year, I'd like to personally wish you the best and hope that the board has a smooth Sunset Review. The department is here to offer us our support and assistance with whatever you may need during this process. 
Our legislative affairs staff are available to you for any guidance or preparation needed for your review. The, your, for your review, which is scheduled this coming Febru February 26th. The assistance can include conducting mock hearings or reviewing your questions and responses. Please let us know how the department can best support you during this, pro during this process. This concludes the department's update. Again, appreciate the time you afforded me. We have a very busy agenda. Happy to enter entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Director. And um, if we have other commissioners have any questions, uh, thank you for, we have had a, 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 a very, I think, uh, detailed and exhaustive preparation process for Sunset. We've been on calls, and you know, Andy's, we've done a lot of paper draft drafting and reviewing, and we're waiting for the final report. Yes, sir. When do you expect the report? Today. Today. Okay. Yes, sir. So that'll be good. And then, uh, so we appreciate all the support that you've given us, and we're, we feel like that we are prepared. I think you're going to have mentioned that on there. So thank you for, the, for all that. You're welcome. And, and welcome to Chris Castrillo for all his support and all that stuff. He's not going to introduce you. I will, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners? There's a quiet bunch today, right there, so <laughs> thank, thank you, you for coming down here and seeing us. Really nice to see you. Thank you. See you soon. Okay. Um, I, you guys just are you guys ready to go and yeah. make your presentation? Okay. So um, Ms. Zingano is here. So here we are. Agenda item number six: view and possible action on petition to change the decision. <coughs> The Kathleen Zingano versus Megan Anderson Bow, December 29, 2018, in Los Angeles, California. Mr. Foster, do you want to make a few comments, set this up before we um, this gentleman? Well, I, I think I think we all know why we're here, and we have a video. Um, let me just make this clear to the commissioners. I've been in communication with Mark Goddard this morning. If the commissioners would like to talk to the referee. I can get him on the phone, okay? But you, I would request just a few minutes to get to make that happen because he's in England, and I've got we got the phone here. I can make it happen, um, but he's put a written statement in the record for the commissioners um, to review, as well as there's a written statement from the MMA Rules Committee. You will notice commissioners that there's not a recommendation from 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 me from your executive officer that's by design um, I assisted with the initial draft of some of this language back in 2008 when I was on the MMA committee I think it'd be a little bit disingenuous to or maybe a conflict or whatever for me to con comment on, on something uh, that 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 I was pretty close to. However, the language has been amended. The new unified rules. Um, I'm sure Mr. Gable will uh, talk in detail about this. This I've never saw this particular thing happen before, and this is important for a commission to actually comment on formally. I'd like to see where a group of public members come down on this because this is never. To my knowledge, I've never saw this, certainly not at a high level. I've never saw it. I've been watching this stuff for a long time. So with that, sir, that's the reason there's no recommendation in, in the packet. We have a letter here that was distributed. Is this today? From Ms. Zingano's ophthalmologist or obstetrician? Sir, that's a, that's a health document, and that's the reason I didn't put it in the packet. <coughs> Okay. Oh, good. Just to clarify, so it was received timely, according to uh, the, the, uh, the deadlines the, for. The they contract. reached out to us and asked us about it, and I said, "No, we're not going to put this in the packet. Mm -hmm. we'll, 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 you can. This is one of the. This was the process that I thought was better." Mm -hmm. So you were thinking about protected health information. Correct. So this is a public hearing now. We're discussing it. I That's that correct. They they just told me that they. Ms. Zingano, that you're okay with that. It's being discussing the <coughs> That's correct. The details of your injury. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
So we are going to hear. Uh, so can we? Can you tell us who is here representing both sides? If there are two sides here, Nathan Gable, sir, is representing. Um, Nathan Gable is representing Miss Zingano. Um, he's he's her attorney. I deal with uh, uh, him on a regular basis with other promotions as well. And uh, you know, I'm I'm here representing um, the commission. The commission well, what staff. About Megan Anderson, is she? Where is she? Uh, no, sir. She's she's not. She's she's in Australia. Or just, I don't know where she lives. But she, she, she did get a letter. Australia. Yeah. Kansas. Don't know where she's. Kansas she's, or Australia? Australia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not sure where she. Is. I don't know. We sent her a letter. <laughs> yeah. This isn't Kansas anymore. Totally. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sorry. What? Um, so has she contributed anything to this, or she's staying silent? That's not to my knowledge, okay. sir. Okay. Um, Here we go. Okay. Wow. Commissioner, shall we give Mr. Gable a chance to make his presentation? Sure. Sir, please introduce yourself for the record. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nathan Gable. I'm here to uh, represent Catherine Zingano for her USC 232 bout that was scheduled for Vegas that moved in the 11th hour to California. Remember that event? Oh, yeah, we remember sure that event. Thank you. Yeah. Some PTSD from that, I'm sure. Um, the bout was ruled a TKA loss. And if would we like to roll the video first and we could see what happened? Uh, the bout ended within the first minute of the first round. So, commissioners, if you want to come around to see it, uh, I, I was there. So, I saw it. Um, Councilor Ms. Ingano, this is not a court of law, so you're welcome to stand up here and, and, and narrate this for us. Whatever you two would like to do, just provide as much information as you think it can help us. Okay? That's the best look you see. Uh, you can see the toe. And Ms. Zingano, would you introduce yourself too, please? I'm Kat Zingano. I'm in the black with the toe and the eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And here today in black. Yeah. <clears throat> on, on the slow mo, you can see that the toe grazes across the eye socket and winds up in the eyeball under the eyelid. There's a not so high resolution photo, which was better on the appeal letter I put, showing the minute that the toe gets caught under the eyelid. This has the toenail going into the eyeball. A better description is in that doctor's letter for what right happened after there. There, you can see there's a mild crossing of the graves across the eye socket. There's the toe underneath the eyelid which we are contending is an eye gouge to distinguish between an eye socket. Oh, so, I'm sorry. I'm drifting over there. Um, and so you, you see two components of this. You see a, uh, a legal strike of the toe crossing the eye socket. That's the cavity that has the eyeball in it. And then you have a toe going underneath the eyelid into the eyeball. That is a gouge. If we read rule number two, as cited by the materials in there, we have two materials submitted 
uh, starting on page 30 and 32 of the materials for the committee. One's an email from Mark Goddard. One's a letter from the ABC. They all mention rule number two, and it states, eye gouging of any kind. Um, eye gouging by means of fingers, chins, elbows is illegal. Then it qualifies later, legal strikes or punches that contact the fighter's eyes are not eye gouging and shall be considered legal strikes. In both of the materials we see comment on this, but I think they just failed to distinguish between the fact that a strike to the eye socket is quite different than a, a gouge to the eye. We are not appealing the strike. We have no issue with the strike across her eye socket. We do, however, find this to be an eye gouge of any kind. It is also important to note that the contact to the eye socket was very minimal. I don't think anyone could contend that that's the reason this fight stopped. It was the eye gouge and the damage to her eye that made it inability to defend herself because she couldn't open her eye. This is an accidental eye gouge. It should result in a no contest. In the ABC letter, that, again, this starts on page 32 of the materials, the committee noted that the kick was legal and that there was no intent. Now, again, they point out, they also conclude that um, toes are not included in rule number two. And this does not need to be included in number two because number two is written in a way that is open-ended. It begins with eye gouging of any kind and then lists a numbers of ways in which that could happen. That would be fingers, chins, elbows. Now that could include other things as well. It could include thumbs. Now thumb is not a finger. That's not the way it's described in the dictionary. We could include noses in there. I'm sure a, a toe, as you can see now, can gouge an eye, and that's an eye gouge of any kind. This isn't the common understanding of the words of any kind. If I said, hey, I'm here and I will take cash of any kind, $1 bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, you, you wouldn't say, hey, I've got a $20 bill, so I'm guessing you won't take that. No, it's, a, it's a, an eye gouge of any kind. It's cash of any kind. So any kind is an open-ended, non-exhaustive list that follows that. It wasn't meant as limiting whatsoever. This is in contrast to Rule 9, which is limited. Rule 9 doesn't say outstretch fingers of any kind or outstretch anything of any kind. Second, they point to the part that this is a legal kick. And as I discussed before in Rule number 2, it ends with legal strikes or punches that contact the eye socket are not eye gouging. As we see here, we're not contesting the legal strike at all. And th there's a very big distinqu distinguishment between a strike and a gouge. If I were to, if an opponent was to take their fist and punch the eye socket, that is not an eye gouge, that is a strike. There's a difference between the word strike and gouge. So this limiting, limiting language, the last sentence of Rule 2, in no way removes the fact that an eye gouge, you can call it a strike and it's no longer a foul. I don't see how in, in, under any circumstance, if these rules were applied in the fashion that they're suggesting, that there would ever be an eye gouge or no contest resulting from such. There's a, it's written that way. We're required to read it in the plain language that it's meant to be in, the common sense definition of that. And, and frankly, to, to read it in the way that the ABC is suggesting doesn't make any sense, doesn't leave any room for uh, an accidental eye gouge. And again, to the extent that the kick was legal, the determination of whether a kick is legal or not, or any strike in MMA, is not how it starts off, it's, it's where it's end. If I make a kick to the body, that's legal. But if that kick lands in the groin, it is illegal. If I hit you, if it hit an opponent to the back of the, it hit an opponent to the head, that's legal. 
but when it hits the back of the head, it is illegal. And same with this. If I hit the eye socket, legal. If that also gouges the eye, that is illegal. Second, to the extent that both Goddard and the ABC point out that it needed to be deliberate or intentional, uh, the rules and notes uh, <coughs> nowhere mentions that these fouls have to be intentional. I don't know how you would make a determination of whether someone wanted to do it or not. In fact, the rules contemplate accidental fouls. And as such, that have re reached many rulings that uh, accidental fouls are reasons for no contest. There has been recent fights, people I've worked with, who have experienced the same thing. Uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. versus Kevin Casey. The result was accidental eye poke, no contest. So th there's no such thing as, uh, I, I found no evidence of a deliberate eye poke. There's several examples of uh, unintentional. So the, the conclusion by ABC and um, Mark Goddard that it needs to be delivered or intentional uh, is irrelevant to this. The other thing is, if we go to Mark Goddard's email, it starts at page 30 of the materials. I count it as the sixth full paragraph down. He gives, he gives his conclusion here. There are only two opportunities to deal with a violation concerning the eyes under unified rules. Gouging, which is deliberate, which we just mentioned, that's not true. You have accidental eye pokes all the time. The rules contemplate accidental eye pokes. Even gives instructions to referees what to happen during an accidental foul. And then the second qualification, I think this is very telling, is that the fingers must be outstretched and fingers outstretched towards eye or opponent, resulting in a poke. Of course, that this was neither. So he's, he's citing uh, outstretched fingers which doesn't appear in Rule 2. It appears in Rule 9. Rule 9 is not Rule 2. Rule 2 is Rule 2. Rule 9 is Rule 9. They are different. They're separate. They're independent. Um, and they are, uh, the fouls occur in much different ways. An eye gouge is a foul under 2. Number 9 and under number two, that requires actually contact with the fighter. Under number nine, the, the outstretched finger rule, which both the ABC and Goddard are looking at, and Goddard is saying that it is the second condition to finding an eye poke. Uh, let, let's read the rule. Fingers outstretched toward an opponent's eyes, face or eyes, in the standing position. A fighter that moves their arms towards their opponent with an open hand fingers pointing to the opponent's face, eyes, will be a foul. So let's let's look at the operative word here compared to um, two, which is gouging. This is moving their arms towards an opponent. So a foul under this uh, rule wouldn't require them to touch them at all. It is moving your fingers towards the head or face, and that in and of itself is a foul. If you if you've watched this being called People in the fighting position, they're saying, hey, close your fist, close your fist. The referees tell them to do it. If you don't do that and you keep your fingers pointed, you could result in a point or being DQ'd. It doesn't require at all the contact whatsoever. We Mr. are not Gable, appealing that. We have no problem. I think you're making your point oh, over and over. Do you want to wrap up? Maybe we can hear from Kat because you can also answer questions. Sure. <clears throat> You want to talk about the policy of uh, if they were to allow toes to the eyes? Or Anything you'd like to add? Uh, okay. Yeah. Anything. It's no problem. Good morning. Um, so, you know, one thing that um, I, I don't think she could have done this on purpose over again, but I do, I am curious if, you know, 
there isn't going to be a rule that constitutes what considers an eye poke or not, does that equal open season on people with good toe dexterity as far as finding ways to get out of certain situations, learning push kicks deliberately to go straight to the eye? Like, I just, um, I just, I think that there's such a vague uh, distinction in the rules. It's dangerous for fighters moving forward. Um, and so you would like to see what then? Um, I guess to figure out change. something unified between people as far as what constitutes an eye poke and what is the action taken for that. I, I thought I lost my eye. I didn't know. How are you? I, I still have problems. I still see spots and like little lightning bolts. Um, for a while, it just seems like out of the side of my face, I feel like I see like I'm underwater. Um, it's better, but it's not great. Uh, I'm told it'll recover, but it's not a fast recovery. And right now I can jog and I can lift weights, but even doing so, I still get like this pulsing in my eye and then these lightning bolts. And I mean, I, I, granted, it's my life and my whatever, but I, I, we as fighters, we need to go home, you know? And if, if something like this retires us, we need to go get a regular job and raise kids and drive to work and things like that. And, you know, if people get hit in the nuts with an elbow or a fingertip or a forehead or whatever, you guys stop it to see if they're okay. Mm -hmm. And in this case, like, I was told to get teed off on, and I, at that point, wasn't even caring about getting my hand raised. I needed someone to check if I was okay. Because I, I really thought if I opened my eye, it was going to fall out on my face. And I didn't have a second to really even regroup to see if that was the case before I was just getting whacked again. And... I understand this is not something that everyone's been trained in up until this point. I mean, because clearly I don't feel like it's written, but I do feel like it's something that I would like to see written for fighters moving forward. Okay, got it. And obviously you're asking us to declare the bow to no contest, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have more presentation, Ken or Mr. Gable? I just want to finish with the, uh, Mark Goddard was the one who made the call. He has the power to de declare this, you know, no contest or the TKO. I think his letter is evidence that he got the rule wrong. Citing the outstretched finger rule as part of Rule 2 demonstrates his misunderstanding of the application. Uh, saying that it's a requirement to show intent also sh shows his misunderstanding of the application. I think on this reason alone, this should be uh, a no contest. Okay, thank you both. Would you hang for a second, please? Yes. Commissioners, um, you want to start? Commissioner Arby. Uh, Mr. Foster, um, could you, ha has, has this issue ever come up before in other fights, or is this the first instance of this issue? It's the first instance that I've ever dealt with it and that I've ever saw it dealt with. I, I agree 100% with what Ms. Singano said. I think that the committee needs to to address this and look at it, this has not the happened. The ABC, uh, the ABC Rules Committee right. at the unif you know, that, that creates the unified rules. You have the floor if you'd like. More questions, and we can come back to you. Well, my only other question is, if we were to uh, reverse this, would this have would this open the floodgates to other decisions uh, moving forward? It's just something that comes up in my my mind. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, on the video, I see, you know what you are arguing, but, you know, in terms of the impact on the eye. But for me, there's also broader implications of, of if we were to decide to reverse this decision, would then other people be able to appeal decisions that were made in the past? Well, I, I've not saw this happen before, so I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's a floodgate of people that have been, because I've not saw this toe in the eye before, my concern is regarding a floodgate would be the language in Rule Two, especially the second sentence of Rule Two, is 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 crystal clear of what constitutes a legal strike. And my my concern is is what is exactly what she said. The committee has to go back and fix this. I don't think they've, anybody's ever thought of this. I mean, I've never never saw it before. Um, that's my concern with yeah, this. Just one last question. Sure, of course. Just, just on that, uh, to, to your point, Mr. Foster, about the, the committee, so would, this, would you recommend this 
the commission making a recommendation to the committee to further define rule two in terms of eye gouging? Is that what you're suggesting? I would. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner? I don't have any questions. No questions? Okay. Commissioner Mayo? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, I, um, I, I saw the fight. And I, I saw everything happen, everything developed. So very unfortunate uh, situation. I actually wanted to see the fight go on. But things like this happen, you know, frequently uh, during fights. I mean, it just happened over this past weekend um, uh, on ESPN. So uh, it happens all the time. Maybe not an iBook or what have you, but uh, other types of uh, in situations like this always arise in the fight. Uh, what I... Uh, what, what I was uh, wondering about, uh, and I don't see it here anywhere in the writing, is uh, when it comes to clipping the nails, because I, I think the allegation is it was, it, was the, it was the nail that maybe got in the eye, maybe not the toe itself. So wondering if we have any rules and regs uh, within the books as to how trim the nail has to be, toenail and hand nails. We That's do. The first question. Can, can I mention what is the, what is the rule? Yeah, go ahead. Go I, had, ahead. I had heard that she um, borrowed, uh, right before the fight, that she had borrowed a nail clipper from one of the uh, athletic commission people, the ones that stay with you. I don't mm. know Inspectors. what. Inspectors. There you go. Um, so she had cut it in the locker room, which I, I don't know how long that makes it, but I do know that that makes it sharp. You know, So I don't know how, uh, if, if there's something that could be touched or filed down or, you know, something that could go into maybe keeping that as less of a dagger, that'd be kind of cool. But, um, so, so I don't know if for this particular decision that's a consideration, uh, but I think moving forward and to your point about, you know, one, first and foremost, protecting the fighters, uh, that's something that should probably be looked at uh, a little bit closer as to, you know, the length. I don't know if it's got to be specific to the length, but at least uh, what's an appropriate... Uh, trimming the nail, not just for the toe, but you know, obviously for the hands as well. The other thing I wanted to clarify on is is this whole uh, argument about um, whether or not the eye poke has to be intentional. Uh, it seems to me, based on on the, the the way this is written, that the answer is no. But I want to see if I can get some clarification from some of the experts that know the rules or has written the rules or helped write, write the rules. So I'm looking at you, Mr. Foster. <laughs> or, or maybe one of the commissioners that actually know a little bit more than I do. So <laughs> my take is this. Because we're all around when, this, when, the, when the rule was modified. Mm -hmm. So when they said, when they changed the rule to, if your hand is at eye level, you have to close the fingers, otherwise it becomes a foul. If it's not, and you poke the eye, then it becomes deliberate, because it's a deliberate act to open your hand. So when they say, close your fingers, close your fingers, close your fingers, and that is what they mean by this. Of course, you can interpret it other way, but that is what they mean by a deliberate act, because you're, you're intentionally opening up your hands. You either, and they tell you this in the locker room, they tell you this when they're, you either move your hands down, you move your hands up, if you want to open up your fingers, otherwise you close your hands. That's why it becomes deliberate. Because that is, hold on. Let me, let Do not me. interrupt, sir. Just wait, please. Thank you. We understand your position because you've made it many times. But this is what they're saying. That's why Mark Goddard is saying with your foot, you can't actually close it. Right. Okay. We understand your position. You were going to comment on the nail clipping and on that matter. Yeah, the, the inspectors keep the, we, we have nail clip in, available and they make sure that the fingers and the, the toes are, are clipped for the fighters before they, you know, specifically for mixed martial arts, le less so for boxing for obvious reasons. But, uh, and kickboxing. Yeah, and for kick, kickboxing. But, um, the Other comments for that? Commissioner Connors, Vice Chair. I have a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, thought your uh, your legal letter was very logical and, and helpful. So thank you for that, Mr. Gable. Um, Quitson, you said that the list in uh, current Rule Two is not a list of exclusion. It's that a it, is a, I mean, limit and limitation. And um, can you explain that? 
Well, it begins with the words of any kind and, and then lists a number of items that could be. Uh, it would be like me saying, I like sushi of any kind. I like tuna. I like yellowtail. Um, I like halibut. That also means I like uni and toro and other things. It, of any kind is an open-ended uh, preface to that sentence. Second, the three things that are listed in there, fingers, elbows, and chins, are just an uh, illustrative list of examples. It doesn't include thumbs. We know thumbs can also be included in an eye gouge. I, I'm assuming a nose could be there. It's of any kind in the list. And a good comparison would be to compare that to Rule 9, which is just outstretched fingers. Okay, There's just, no open-ended. OK, question. So you're interpreting the heading of Rule 2 as part of the actual rule? Yeah, correct. Thank you. Dr. Williams. Um, just uh, one comment, or maybe a couple of comments. One is that, um, uh, Mr. Gable, I think one of your uh, assertions is that Rule 2 and Rule 9 are separate and independent and, and have nothing to do with one another. Not necessarily nothing to do with, but they're not inter interconnected. They're not prerequisite for one another's. You don't have to have outstretched fingers to gouge somebody with an elbow or with a chin. And, the, and if, if, I read, if I read the letter that we got from the chairman of the ABC's MMA Rules and Regulations Committee, he, he I, it seems to me, takes a different position. He says uh, the issue of eye pokes was further addressed with the adoption of Rule 9. So he is, he is connecting Rule 2 and Rule 9. And that's not necessarily uh, different from what I'm saying. It could be saying, hey, look, Rule Number 9 was... Uh, it, it in, in, enacted in part to avoid eye pokes or unnecessary eye pokes from people doing this. This could lead to eye pokes, but the, the foul of rule number nine is moving your hands. I don't have to poke your eyes. I don't have to touch you. I'll get warnings for having my fingers outstretched towards your face. That alone, if I ignore the referee, could end a fight. I don't have to gouge your eyes. The, the verb is move, not gouge. I guess the point I'm making is that those two are connected, according to mm -hmm. the people who wrote the rules. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. But, Dr. Williams? No, no, that's it. Yes. Well, uh, let, let's finish with questions. Commissioner Seller? Uh, I would be appreciative if the executive director would summarize our options and make a recommendation. Okay, now I've been asked. Okay. <laughs> that's, 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 that, there, there is a difference there. Um, the options are you could let the decision stand. You could make it a no contest. To me, those are the two the two options. If you make it a no contest, you take what is a. the case for both of the options? Uh, the case for letting letting the letting the 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 win stand. Uh, would be uh, the second sentence of Rule 2. Legal strikes or punches that contact the fighter's eye socket are not eye gouging and shall be considered legal attacks. Okay, That's the option. That's where Mark Goddard, the referee, went. That's where every single member of the MMA Rules Committee who had a meeting about this came down on this issue. Okay. And I don't have to go through this list, but if you'd like me to, I could give you the bio of who these people are. The, the option to make it a no contest, Mr. Gables laid out in best he can the rationale for making it a no contest. I think it's an interesting argument, it's a compelling argument, but rule two, the second sentence is quite clear in my view, um, but that would be the rationale. But if the commission did choose to make this a no contest, recall it just because she's not here, you would be taking away a fighter's win. Now, Sean Shelby, as soon as this was over, he came to me. He's the matchmaker for the UFC, and he's like, "Man, Andy, you know, he 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 just thought that he you know he thought the rules should be addressed a bit further as well, like in the, you know I won't go into a private conversation, but I mean I think we all." have not saw this before. So it does need to be addressed 
in the future. But what I've got to go on as your executive director is rule two. If you're asking for a recommendation, I go with rule two, second sentence, the decision stands, TKO. Other questions, sir? No. Commissioner Marshall? <coughs> Um, I think we should have a motion and then we can I, I, I have one more I have one question. Question. Okay. So um, Dr. Williams, maybe you can help me out with this with my uh, anatomy one oh one. So rule two excuse me, rule rule two, um, a second sentence. It says legal strikes that connect with the fighter's eye socket. Um, would it be correct to assume that eye socket does not include the eyeball, that the socket is the the bony part? Well, you know, I, I think the way I would interpret that would include the socket, which is rounds the bony part, and, and the content. Okay. Uh, and you can, you know, you could have some contact with either or both and, and meet criteria for that rule. For ice right. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, we need a motion so we can proceed with it. Invite members of the public to. Can I make one? Another question? Go ahead. My question is a comment. Well, we're going to okay, get the comments. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Okay. So uh, this is a motion about um, the request is to declare this a no contest or leave it stand. That's our motion. A recommendation to the ABC to go back and look at this rule, which they've already done, is merely a discussion or, a, or an attempt. In, in your motion, <clears throat> to let the decision stand is a nay or an a. As it would be phrase, I. It would be I. This. It would be an I. We let the decision stand as a, we do not overturn. So it's an I. So do we have a motion, commissioners? To let it stand. Yes. Any any motion. That's one. Uh, well, okay. So I'll move to follow the EO's recommendation to let the decision stand. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Do we have any other motions? I move to uh, change it to a no contest. Do we have a second on a no contest? That motion dies for lack of second. Do we have any other motions? Okay, so we have a motion to let the decision stand, and now we can invite members of the public to comment. Um, you are welcome to come up and be recognized. Yes, sir. Make a I'm getting to that. So I, I see no members of the public uh, standing to be recognized. And so, uh, any final comments by the commission before we call for the vote? Yes, sir. Commissioner Harvey. So um, I understand where the um, fighter president is, is um, making this appeal. I think what we have to do, I, and I'm comfortable, and I'm going to support the motion. But I do think we need a little bit more clarity in terms of def definition moving forward of eye gouging. I think it's it, it would be hard for me to vote to overturn this decision without a clearer definition here. But I think moving forward, we should have a clearer definition and in including you know including other being more specific about including other things besides you know fingers, knees, and maybe adding toes into that because um, then it will give more clarity moving forward. It's harder to I think as a referee to make a call. If there's not clarity around the rules, and I just I would feel uncomfortable with no clarity around the rules in time to overturn this decision. So I, I stand with the motion, and I'm going to fully support it. Okay. Any other final comments, commissioners? Yeah. Yes. So uh, first, Ms. Ngano, thank you for being in this sport and participating as long as you have, and being one of the females who really brought this sport along and we recognize you and thank you for coming here Mr. Gable um, making the argument as best as you possibly can I think it's important because um, this is really how I think rule two came about you know um, people bringing bringing appeals because of the eye gouging with the fingers and things like that um, I know I've watched, I don't know, tens of thousands of rounds of fighting, both MMA and probably more than that with kickboxing. I have never, ever seen not one time a kick that hit an eyeball, an eye socket, and I, I mean, 
this is like all the things had to go that way. And I've asked, I don't know how many experts in the field, nobody has ever seen this happen. So probably this is why that isn't in there as part of the rule. Um, the eye gouging of any kind, in my opinion, means by sweep, by poke, by that kind of kind, not the toe kind or the, because though that, body part is defined within the body. But having said that, that doesn't mean that because we've never seen it or because it's not, that it shouldn't be reviewed and added in there as something that could possibly happen. So you're right. And I'm happy that you brought it here to protect future fighters. Um, so we would like to see something more defined and that isn't our place it's the place of the abc and the rules committee and so with that thank you very much for bringing it to our attention other comments is it the uh, will of the commission to ask the executive officer to to address this with the abc rules committee yes. and then come back and report to us on on what their position is on further defining this. Do we agree as a commission to that? Yes. Okay. Please, okay. Mr. Foster, I appreciate that. I will. Okay. Um, I want to add my, with these two commissions, my colleague said, and also express my frustration and disappointment on your behalf. I was there, and I was rotten, just rotten. So I can't think of a better adjective than that. I wish we could do more to help you, but uh, I think you understand why this is going down the way it is. Please don't stop fighting. Please don't be a great ambassador for the sport. You deserve it. That was just a just a rotten luck night. So with that, please call the roll. This is an aye to Can lead I, the motion as... You didn't ask for more comments from me. Oh, so well, I I see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just a final, uh, final comment. Um, the rules of statutory construction are that if something is ambiguous, which arguably this is because of the um, the heading of two, eye gouging of any kind, and then you have a list, is that a list of limitation or only by example? So the rules of statutory construction are that if it's ambiguous, the, the deciding body can look to public policy and say, well, is this a, is this a reasonable construction? What will be the result? Of, um, of ruling one way or the other, and um, what is the intent behind this statute or this, this rule. And so, uh, for the record, those were my reasons, part of my reasons, um, to put forth the competing motion. And you yelled at me. <laughs> I, did, I almost whacked you. So. <laughs> Thank you. That would be intentional. We need rule two. Um, please call the vote. Chairman Carvelli. Aye. Vice Chair Lehman? Nay. Commissioner Senior Quidez? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner Dr. Williams? Aye. Commissioner Ayala? Aye. Commissioner Araby? Aye. 6 1, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank both, you. Thank both of you. Thank you. We are at agenda item number seven review and approval of changes to examination of boxer applicants' regulation language. Mr. Foster. Mr. Chairman, we've been working on this examination of boxer applicants um, for many, many years. We're close uh, to getting this thing filed with, wouldn't you agree, Spencer, with, with, with OAL? Spencer, would you like to speak about the... The, the really the only a lot of this was was a lot of these were changes that these were changes not a lot these were changes from the director of the legal affairs unit uh, Ryan Marcroft um, and he he's been very helpful with the commission in getting these things um, uh, So is the 
reason why these weren't in our packet? Yes. Um, it's a turning point privilege, so I guess I'm okay. Okay. Going forward, and I guess we had this also issue about the, the health uh, yeah. HIPAA issue. Is there some way that you can send more of a confidential separate email to um, uh, to us in, before the meeting? Sure. Because the whole point is we don't, I don't, don't have time to really, yeah, it's, wow. They would have to be encrypted emails. I don't know if you guys can do that, but How? you'll let us know. I, I don't know. Just yeah. look in something. What? Yeah, I, 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 I'll make sure you have it, ma'am. You know, ma as I uh, understand, you know, there's reasons why these aren't part of the public packet or posted. But sure. on the other hand, the, the downside is that we're receiving this at the moment we're making decisions. And that's why we so did. So there ought to be another way. Yes, ma'am. So, so for the public, we have the commissioners have been handed a proposed text change to this Rule 280 examination of boxer applicants. There are a lot of, there are significant Comments. Which so, Mr. Foster, what do you propose here? What, what, what's the happening to the um, to the language? A yes, direct sir. result of Ryan's comments. Holy and cow! Since Are you sure we're close? <laughs> oh, he's the last person at the department to review that. So there's a lot of comments. But yeah. I reviewed the the redlined revised statute, and it it seemed it's fine. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of. I think what's what's in the thing that's just hand out are the reasons for it. Oh, but it comments. just seemed a lot of, it didn't seem the red line yeah. version, there was a whole bunch of substantive changes. Yep, yeah, it's not that substantive. You're yeah. right, Mary. Okay. So if the commission. Yeah. Commissioners, you have the proposed text. Right. right. It's just okay. so this is the reason not. behind it. Okay. Be clear, I just got this late. I just got this last week. But anyway, um, there was two, there was really one, um, what I consider to be kind of a substantive change. And you can see his comments there on number H. Um, he struck, made in its discretion. Yeah, but see, I don't think that's a big deal because it says equivalent. So the determination of equivalent is kind of in our discussion. So that's, right. that's where I exactly when I was reviewing this, that was my. I was like, well, it's the same thing. We're going to send you to law school, Andy. <laughs> Actually, you can challenge the bar exam. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Gentlemen, do you have a more to tell us? Do you asking us to? Is there a motion to accept these changes? Talk to me. The motion, if you agree with these changes, the motion would be to approve the um, amended language and to direct staff to continue the rulemaking process. Post haste. Post haste. <laughs> now that'd be found I, I haven't had a chance yeah. to read these. Are these, there are no further changes. These are just reasons, right? That's right. Okay. This looks like the work paper, so we can see the background, okay. right? Got it. Okay. Uh, more questions for these gentlemen, or should we have a motion? We can have more discussion. Do I have a motion to approve the we'll approval? We have a okay. Commissioner Ayala made the motion to approve. Second. Second. Dr. Williams, we have a motion. Comments, commissioners. Yes. Sure. Um, that um, uh, that of course we want this all go forward. We understand there's a new process, and there were various reasons why it's delayed, and it's not on you. But I I am I'm concerned because you're leaving us. So if you could to whoever taking your place, you can make sure this does not get buried. I will absolutely do that. Yeah, and and then I think we talked about for getting this stuff approved, maybe doing a telephonic meeting versus waiting for the next scheduled meeting. Um, this would go. I mean, for, for, we talked about in December for these revisions to do it telephonically, so we wouldn't have to wait till today. But may, maybe one month difference isn't a big deal. But just just so we're clearly on the record, because there's funding stuff in here that's important to us. This package will be sent um, directly to Ryan. Um, he'll just compare it, and if no additional changes were made, which okay. they haven't been then they'll just go ahead and, and notice it. 
Okay. That's it? Yes. That's it? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, that's not it. And I know commissioners on in Andy's report, item B, I think we're going to touch on the regulation process, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're going to come back to the regulation process because I think we all have comments to make about that. So, there is, so this is not going to get done before the next meeting? No. no. <laughs> so many. Okay. No, no phone call. More comments or questions about the motion to approve the, these changes? Members of the public are welcome to come up and dive into these lurid details of this proposed change. Okay, I, seeing no uh, members of the public willing to testify, we will please call the roll. Chairman Carvelli? Aye. Vice Chair Lehman? Aye. Commissioner Senior Quito? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner Dr. Williams? Aye. Commissioner Ayala? Aye. Commissioner Araby? Aye. 7 0, sir. Agenda item number eight subcommittee updates. Um, we This is under the heading of our pension fund subcommittee, and we have reports from our contracted consultants. First report being from Beth Harrington for Benefit Resources regarding the status of our pension fund administration. Welcome, Beth. Thanks for coming down. Now you can give us a year end report. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice, nice morning. to be here today, and we have a fresh report for you Excellent. instead of one that's 11 months old. Thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank the commission and the members there. They worked really hard to get the rounds and purse data to us early this year, and it was in really good shape. Um, so very much appreciate their hard work. Um, and then the DCA staff got us the accounting on their off fiscal year. So lots of things came together to get all this done for today's meeting. Uh, the balance in the plan at the end of 2018 was just shy of $5 million, $4,950,000. Uh, we have 287 covered boxers, and their balances represented $3,779,840 of the plan assets. Of uh, those 287, 11 were paid uh, $176,000 in 2018. There were 11 potential late claimants who were beyond the three-year benefit window, meaning they came to the commission after they had attained age 54 to request benefits after they were in the payment window. So we processed those distributions as well, and those represented about $186,000. In addition to the 176? In addition to the 176. Thank you. Any questions on the... I'm terrible at math. What's the average payout? The average payout is right about $15,000. Um, some are a little over twenty. dollars some are just under ten. dollars so I'll average it out at about $15,000. John, when you and I redid this whole pension thing, we discussed at some point there being enough of a payout that we might start thinking about having to collect more to be the, right. but we never discussed what that number would be. And there's right. been, we're working on close to a million dollars since, you know, not quite, but close to a million dollars in payouts since the time we started, right. you and I. And I, I don't know if we're close enough to well, that. Number. I think that's a good question maybe to get Pat's opinion on. And it, it, the fund balance is about the same, right? It's a little bit less, but it's basically the same. Yeah, so the charts kind of put a visual res representation behind what's going on with the plan assets. So we were at a high in 2013, and uh, at the end of 2018, our plan assets were at a low for that um, time period that we're looking at. Distributions have slowed down a little bit, but um, we're pretty stable in the number of participants getting paid each year. So the same number, you know, in the neighborhood of, let's see how many, 11 people got paid this last year. So at what point should we start getting worried about? So since, um, Commissioner Shenyuchki does, since this is a defined contribution plan, um, there's not the same worry that you have with a pension plan that you're going to run out of assets because we assign the assets to each person every year. So there's an, a, an amount of this 
account that's attributable to each covered boxer and each pending boxer every year. Um, the only time those benefits go away is when we put uh, transfer balances to suspense for people who are beyond the payment window of ages 50, 51, and 52. Once they're 54, we t um, turn that money over to the suspense account. That's frankly where my concern lies. We have over $2 million worth of benefits that were transferred to that suspense account. We have some people coming back and requesting those balances, but right now we have, so of those balances that get transferred to suspense, um, it was when we did this last iteration of changes to the pension, we hold back 20% of those transfers to be held for future benefit payments. That suspense account is down to $23,000. So that's one From big two name. million? There's two million that have got transferred to suspense um, over time, but I've only got 20,000 that I'm holding for p making payments to future benefits. So what happens is if we have 11 people who come requesting benefits, it's gonna be more than the 23,000 that we have in suspense. So what we would do is we would take it from balances that are currently being transferred to suspense. So if we had 18 people who attained age 54, their benefits transferred to suspense, we would use those transfers first to pay the benefits to the people who um, found us after their age 54. But it's leaving that suspense of balance uh, but precariously so you're low. It from other people's right. money, basically. And can you just transfer it back? Well, the risk is that more people come to, uh, claiming benefits than we have forfeitures or suspense balances transfers. That's and what do we concern. do if that happens? That's a good question. Well, what is well that the, might just well, happen a, because we're, we're we've we've. We have been withholding the, um, we have been using money that's from the older boxers that's being transferred to suspense to pay the benefits for those other people. But don't forget, a lot of boxers every year will forfeit $600, $800 because they failed to fight 36. Well, I, under I understand the process, but my thing is like, what is that worst case scenario? Because we've done some things that we're anticipating a lot of claimants were finding people. And so what if we get 11 claimants in the next two months? As a practical matter, does our plan address that? No, it does not. So you have no legal direction to I take have no care legal direction. I would end up going to the commission, and, and I'm sure it would come to you as commissioners to say, here's our challenge. We have, because we've assigned money to all the other active boxers. We can't really take that away from them. We can't? It does, well... I guess we could. It depends you get to on the make plan. the rules. <laughs> it's a defined contribution plan. That's so, the nature of the plan. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 a lot of numbers just got thrown out. I'm a little confused about what's sitting where. So currently in our plan balance, we have $4.9 roughly. Yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. And out of that $4.9 million, about 3.8, give or take, is claimed with 287 boxers, right? So Correct. So if they were to retire, they get their share of that. There's enough money there. So we have a we have a... A balance, if everyone were to claim everything out, we still have a balance around $1.1 in assets, correct? Correct. Okay. So what, where, where does that $1.1 like where does that, like what happens to that $1.1 million? That's one question. So if you look on the financial statements page, there's a shaded area with the number of participants and their balances mm -hmm. to answer your question question, Commissioner Araby. Mm -hmm. So the other million dollars is in the accounts of 1,291 boxers who are still working toward becoming covered. Right. Okay. And then, so the only other question I had is, you said we had an unclaimed balance of, how much was that, the unclaimed balance? So the very bottom, potential late claimants, the bottom of that, that shaded area, 146 people whose balances exceed $2 million. Okay. And that's an un that's unfunded right now. Basically. That's unfunded. Okay. So what we've so been we, doing is, as they come back and request benefits, we take it from people who are already leaving their benefits behind, and we're taking from them to pay the people who have come forward. So essentially, we have a liability of over two million dollars. A potential liability. Potential Again, liability. the 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 plan was designed specifically to 
uh, transfer those balances to suspense because there was a concern at the time that the plan was originally drafted from my understanding that we would lose track of a lot of the people who had met the covered criteria and were uh, they have moved back to another country or that is a and, and we didn't want to have the have the obligation to try to find every single person. Okay, fair enough. So, so what happened to that two million dollars then? So it's been reallocated amongst the participants. We call it. Um, it's part in the regulations. It's called a forfeiture, even though some of it's transferred to suspense. And we are holding back twenty percent toward a suspense account. Um, but that twenty that suspense account has dwindled because we have found the twenty three thousand dollars. So what do you propose that we do about that? Um, my proposal at the bottom of my notes is that we consider increasing the hold back from 20% to 50%, at least for the next couple of years, and see if we can't refor refortify that suspense account because we are finding people because the commission is doing a good job of getting out to people, <laughs> and they are finding the commission even if the, they didn't know they had any benefits. So. Um, like I said, we have had people come back and ask for, for benefits after their money had been transferred. But we have found it in the plan. What there haven't, hasn't been a disaster or an emergency yet that we had to bring forward. Um, but I am concerned at, a, at such a low balance in suspense that I would. And in, re, in the regulations, I looked it up for you so you didn't have to. In Section 404C of the CCR, it allows the commission to adjust the forfeiture reserve account as needed. And um, my recommendation would be that we increase that hold back from 20% to 50% or something like that. And I'd be happy to provide the commissioners with any additional information that you might need, even though you don't like math. How did you arrive at the 50? Um, it to was 30 or 40. It was just a wild number. I just, really? Yeah. I just picked it because 20 is obviously too low. And um, there was no real science behind it, but. Um, can you base that on some real like calculation? Yes. Yeah, so we transferred last year. We transferred one hundred and eighty-six thousand dollars to suspense from people who had attained age fifty-four. We used some of that to pay current benefits, and so that was that we used about eighty thousand of that. So the twenty thousand hold back, twenty percent hold back, is what left us with twenty-three thousand okay, dollars. So, so we used more than 50, almost fifty percent exactly. Um, a little less than 50% to pay benefits for people who came forward this year. So you so did base I, it on some I didn't completely analysis. make it up, okay. but yeah. So You're not helping yourself yeah, or us by that's speaking that's like that. You're a professional. Right. We pay you as a professional. and so It was my best estimate based on okay, what had happened you. in the last two okay, years. Thank you. Well, if uh, it's hold. just shy, I'm sorry. It's okay, Mr. Commissioner. No, oh, I, I, I don't have Jim's clarity with the, the memory of the numbers. Okay. Uh, a basic question. If, if this process continues as it has been good, as it has been in its experience, can you project forward as to where we're going to be in five years? I could do that. I don't have that information. But, but off the top of your head, where yes. are we going to be five years from now? Well, at this Besides current, right, jail. <laughs> we won't be in jail. Um, but we did start That's this not about. Helpful <laughs> That's, right. That's not helpful either. That's not helpful either. At least Mary's not just picking on me today. <laughs> He's catching everyone. Awesome. So, where, where are we going to be in five years if, as you would extrapolate this forward? Yeah. So it, I think most of you were on the commission at the time that this transfer of money to suspense came to my attention because I wasn't doing that for several years. And in 2012, we did this massive adjustment and we transferred lots of balances, which is the majority of that $2 million. Some of those people have come back. But we started with a balance of about $250,000 in suspense. And now, it, after that five years, it's gone down to $20,000. And five years out, where will it be? So it would be, if we were on the same trajectory, we'd be minus $230,000. We would be we, upside down $230,000. If we increase to 50%, That's we should be... So it should be probably a little more than 50% because you're just shaving it at 50%. But the reality is the number of... Uh, 
uh, unclaimed boxers is going down because we're finding well, that. Well, just at 2018, it went down slightly. We can't, yeah. we can't assume that it's going to continue to go down. I yeah. mean, hopefully, if we do a good job, it you know. Commissioner Senator, are you done with your question? Yes. Okay. Vice Chair Lane, do you have more comments? Um, I just, to the point, and thank you for drafting the, these regulations that allow us to change that percentage at our discretion at any time. So theoretically, every meeting, we could make this adjustment. 50%, 60%, 20%, what's going to be our um, uh, our hold back in the suspense count, so. You know, I feel uncomfortable making any recommendation without actually seeing solid solid arguments for this is what, this would equal out to some of the points that were asked in the next, I mean, it would be, in my mind, it would be interesting to look at at a 20% holdback and the next five years here would be at 30%, here's where we'd be at 40, right? To actually get a show of what would be the best calculation moving on a go-forward basis about what recommendation you could carry to us so we can make an informed decision about best to preserve this fund. And then one other thing I would ask is, and, and maybe this is just me some new, Mr. Foster, be, it would be interesting, not now, but what's our outreach program to make sure the, the folks that are owed this money actually have the ability to access this these dollars? Because these dollars are essentially money they paid in, correct? Probably you don't have to, you don't have to do that to now. I just, I'd like to, interview, I'd like to see that. Interview, Luis, Mary, Mar okay, Commissioner. Can I ask yeah. a question? Yes. Once, once we say, tell you, we'll move this to 50%, how long does it take you to make it happen? So we do these numbers once a year, so we can discuss it and, and I'll get you the numbers that you've requested and I'll base it on history. So I'll say, okay, we started in 2012 with this process. Here's how many um, went got transferred to suspense. Here's how many we pulled for, out of suspense to pay. Oh, I'm sorry. And then as we get claimants coming to us asking for money, I'll keep the commission in. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, as a practical matter, once we direct you to change it from 20, let's say, to 50 or 30 or whatever, how long does it take you to execute that? It won't take me long. It's, what does that mean? It's just part of our program, and so right now we have it set at 20 percent. To transfer. I changed the number to 50, and then we yeah. just modify. We do these calculations once a year. It's very easy to change it. If I need more money during the year from that suspense account, we have it available to us. And I'm working with um, Mr. Foster's office regularly on processing the distributions to claimants who have come forward. So listen, Commissioner Allen. Less than a week. Commissioner Allen, you have? No, good. Okay. So I'm, I'm always all about uh, keeping the process moving forward, just like Director Grafilo. So to your comment, which is an excellent point about making decisions off real data, the situation for us is then it's, it's months out before we can do anything until our next meeting, or we'd have to call a special meeting. So I'm thinking about alternatives for us to consider. So first of all, do you have, where do you, where are you on this recommendation to move to a 50% transfer of authority, if you will? Sir, um, my expertise is, I'm going to have to defer to the experts. That's, fine. that's your answer, that's your answer. We, well, here's something we could do, commissioners. We can authorize the executive officer to grant that authority after a review of some more data. Uh, we could authorize our pension fund subcommittee to make that decision for us um, after they review data. It is at least a way for us to keep the process moving forward so we don't have to wait till the next commission meeting and yada, 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 yada. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I would suggest the, uh, the committee we have uh, get deeper into this. And secondly, I think uh, Beth should return in six months and not a year from now. I mean, I think we need, I think we need to be on top of what strikes me as a okay. fragile situation. Is that a motion? Absolutely. <laughs> so I have a motion from Commissioner Souter. I'll second that. One, for you to come back in six months, or there's two meetings from now. How about that, right? Yep. And then also to authorize our pension subcommittee to grant this, this transfer authority up to 50% or something like that upon review of additional data. Do I have a second of that motion? Sure. We have a second. Okay, any other comments? 
Now, this would be you. Oh, no, see, that's counselor. the thing. That's, and I think I raised this last time. I mean, on the pension subcommittee for outreach, and we've done a good okay. job. I'm not a numbers person. I'd be a doctor if I was. Okay. So <laughs> I, I need well, you I or cannot, Martha on this for you, the ones who worked with this pension before. Now, I can simply appoint another to the subcommittee and make that easy. You're supposed to talk at a lot of first meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, I think there's a rule. The first, they have to be on the subcommittee, their first I'm meeting. Okay You're okay with that? Thank you very much. I remember that rule. Your questions are excellent ones. You obviously can figure this out. So we're going to add um, Commissioner Arby to the Pension Fund Subcommittee. He can review this with you. And then uh, we, we're giving the, these folks, particularly you, the authority to uh, get comfortable with that transfer authority of 50% or whatever you think makes sense. I mean, it seems to make sense. So that just work, everyone? Uh, Wait, commissioners? No, I, I, I think we should have a report at our meeting in Sacramento yes, in sir. Uh, December. Well, I think we'll get another report two meetings from now as well. Perfect. So, yeah. Okay. More, more, oh. meet, more reports, the better. Okay, excellent. Okay. So that's something perhaps you can sure. do direct. So the subcommittee, you can work with Andy. He'll organize calls for you, okay. put you directly in touch with Beth. Great. And you can you can keep the business of the commission moving forward. Okay. Yes, sir. So are there three commissioners on that subcommittee? Yes. Um, they will have yes. to hold their meetings publicly. Uh, you can do two, and they won't have to. <laughs> three is a task force, remember? Well, why don't we just have a two a two member committee? Yeah, it makes it so much easier. You want to uh, flip for it? <laughs> <laughs> To Mr. Harvey since okay. <laughs> okay, Commissioner well, I'm going to find something else for him to do anyway. Yes. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Commissioner I'll Keep the process moving forward. Venture Fund Subcommittee, Commissioners uh, uh, Layman and Aramie. Okay. So just to be clear, I'll pre present the summary okay. to Mr. Foster's office, and then they will disseminate it and to the commissioners, and then other. they can okay. call me back yes. or rearrange a phone call. And the commission is going, about to authorize that to all happen. Okay. Before we vote, we can uh, ask any members of the public are welcome to uh, stand up and be heard about this matter. Director Grafilo. Beth, would you let Director Grafilo comment on it? Just want to briefly say I really appreciate uh, the commission's uh, specific and intentional um, desire to get to the root of this issue. Um, anecdotally, anecdotally, on a personal note, uh, folks have asked me what uh, were some of the most rewarding things I've ever done either on the commission or in my role as director DCA, without a doubt, one of the most uh, rewarding things I I've done was giving an ex -box, an ex boxer his, uh, his uh, pension check. So appreciate the attention of this matter. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. It is, uh, too. it is a unique thing. There are two pension funds in the state of California. There's CalPERS and there's this one. It's pretty, pretty significant. Okay. We need a vote. Mr. Foster, please call the roll. Chairman Carvelli. Aye. Vice Chair Lehman? Aye. Commissioner Senior Quidez? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner Dr. Williams? Aye. Commissioner Ayella? Aye. Commissioner Arby? Aye. Seven zero, sir. Yes, you come. Okay. Um, so I'm a bit concerned because obviously this is a big issue that came up and it was and it's obviously something that you've thought about. You said you had a note and it was fifty percent. And this is not in anywhere in your papers or your presentation. And it was just because an astute commissioner happened to ask this. And as I understand... It's in my suspense summary, section three of my notes. Yeah, what? it is. And it's just... It's, it is. It's just one tiny little sentence. Where does it say? What page? Section 3D, 3D of my notes. But it's not... <laughs> you know, and, and the problem is that I just understand this because the chairman and I tore this pension plan apart, you know, five and years ago. And, yeah, and we changed so many things. And so, but the rest of them didn't participate that way. And so they wouldn't know what this means even. You, you understand? And My most apologies. people are not numbers people. And okay. so you have to kind of target that, I think. I you will I, take that into consideration as I make notes in the future. Okay, but you're a fiduciary, correct? I am not a fiduciary you're not. to okay. the plan. Okay, okay. Well, it's your job, your contract, to present to us problems with the account. My okay. job, my main job is to run, um, do the record keeping for the account 
and allocate the, the contributions, process distributions, and so on. I'm a third party administrator. Okay. So, I mean, my uh, part of my job is to report this page to the commission, and that's all that's in my contract. But I'm we happy are the to. Okay. I'm happy so, that's a to problem, I guess, in the sense of, you know, not seeing the day to day and understand. Well, yeah. She's uh -huh. a TPA, and it's our job to ask those questions, right. ask for that data, okay. direct Good point. Mr. Foster to do that. I think you guys are now armed and ready to perhaps, uh, now that we have a better understanding, okay. of a year end. We fixed this process of a year end report meeting because right. we, were, we, were, we were not helping ourselves right. by doing a Sacramento report without looking at the numbers. So we fixed that. Now we're going to fix the next step, and then we're going to get into the okay. get some more data to make good decisions as the fiduciaries. Right? Okay. I wasn't terribly concerned until it happened this year when we had five come out, um, five that needed to be paid from that. Suspension. So these are good problems to have. Yeah. So this is what we want. That's we right. want to face these challenges. That's right. The other good news is that more and more events means more and more contributions. So good things are happening. We need to just better manage it as fiduciaries. That's right. All right. And along those lines, at the last meeting in December, I was asked to provide the commission with a participant search service. Um, we use one through because we manage retirement plans for lots of different companies. So I provided that information. One of the data points that that search service likes to get is social security numbers, which I don't think the commission keeps. Um, but they will do a search based on last known address, date of birth, and name. Um, it just might not be as successful with the fewer data points um, as they would with more data points. But uh, yes, we yeah. provided yeah, that information. Works. So we can certainly work with the commission to uh, continue our outreach We've, to locate more people well, during the, pay the payment period so we get out of this late claimant situation. It doesn't include Social Security numbers? So that they will take social security numbers to do a data search, but I don't believe the commission has social security numbers for a lot of the boxers that privacy, are eligible for benefits. For privacy reasons. We have licensed boxer numbers and federal ID numbers, but that, that doesn't, doesn't mean really much to the, yeah, okay. to the data search people. Any other questions or comments for Beth? Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'll make sure and get that other information to you as soon as possible. Thank you.